welcome to Researcher Revealed. I'm Dr. Rosalind Austin, and this is the podcast where we go beyond just the name that's listed on a paper or presentation at a conference to find out more why that person does health research. On today's episode, we actually have a really unique and special episode for you, because instead of talking to an established researcher or even somebody doing their PhD, we're going to talk instead to somebody who is a PPI or a public and patient involvement facilitator to find out about her journey into research as well as what PPI is. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Researcher Revealed. On today's episode, we have a new guest joining us. Her name is Sharon Court. Sharon, can you introduce yourself to everybody? Hello, it's great to be here and thank you very much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. So as Ross said, I'm Sharon Court and I'm the Patient and Public Involvement Facilitator with the research team at Portsmouth Hospital's University NHS Trust. I got to that in one breath, yay. (laughs) Excellent. Well, we'll We'll dive into a little bit more about what that means and how you got into that role and all that sort of stuff as the episode goes on. But first and foremost, we have to do the rapid 11. Okay. Um, (laughs) Which everybody gets a bit nervous of, but they're easy and fun questions. Are you ready? No, go ahead. (laughs) Are you willing? Regardless. Oh, yes, absolutely. (laughs) Definitely. Perfect. Are you a Windows or Mac user? Windows. Nice. Tea or coffee? Tea. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely um, tea. Yeah. <laughs> when you are writing um, or working, do you prefer to have silence or do you listen to sounds or music? Oh, great question. Depends, actually. So sometimes mm. I like um, kind of acoustic music or uh, when I was doing research stuff there was um, a playlist on Spotify called Deep Focus and that was really nice and that got me into a really good space but other times quiet is fine and I can just kind of potter along and do what I'm doing. Nice I'm gonna ask um, I'll put it in email to remind you later can you mm. share the link of that Deep Focus playlist that you listen oh, yeah. to so mm-hmm. that if people out there listening are like hmm I want to try something new They have a resource ready for them to try some deep focus music. Right. Next question. Where do you tend to work? Uh, That's a great question. Everywhere. Uh, (laughs) My role is peripatetic. So sometimes I'm in the office at the hospital. Sometimes I work from home. Sometimes I'm working because I'm in meetings and I'm in community settings. Um, I'm all over the shop. You used a word that started with P. What does that mean? Para, para, para. <laughs> Peripatetic. It just means you move around a lot. I love that. I've never heard that word before. Oh, word of I the love day. new words. I love new words. They make me so happy. Yeah, so do I. Cool. Peripatetic. I'm going to have to try and incorporate that into my life because I <laughs> love that word. Um, what time of day? So not exact hour, but like morning, evening, night, whatever. Are you? Do you feel you're most productive? Probably in the morning, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I am neither a morning bird nor a night owl. Uh, I'm more of a strange duck. So somewhere between kind of eight and 11 is a good time for me. And then I fade off because of the need for food. And then afterwards, I might have a good burst in the afternoon. And then by about three o'clock, my brain says, what are you doing? You should be horizontal at this point. You have <laughs> Spanish heritage. Why are you awake? And, and so then it becomes a bit of a battle. But yeah, mostly I'd say in the morning. But not too early because I can't do that. Nice. I wish I had the excuse of Spanish heritage to like (laughs) to justify my love of an afternoon nap. But I don't got that. Afternoon naps are the way forward. I'm convinced. (laughs) I agree. Only I don't get the excuse of heritage. I'm jealous. (laughs) Right. Um, Next question. And again, because I'm aware and I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag of where you are in your research journey, you may or may not be able to answer this question. But Mm -hmm. what is your favorite or used referencing management system? Oh, dear Lord. The answer to that is I haven't a clue. (laughs) Fair enough. So it's like a tool that you can use to help organize your reference list when you're writing a paper or your dissertation or things like that. Ah. So it's available software. 
I haven't tried them all out yet. I've had some good suggestions, but because mm -hmm. I am, spoilers, quite early on in this process, um, I haven't really dived into it. So what I have been doing is storing things on an online platform called Evernote. Uh, where I can add the documents, I can add the links, I can put the tags in, but it's not um, it's not like Envivo or something like that, which organizes all of your references for you in a particular format. So it wouldn't be Envivo that does that. It's EndNote, Zoltero, oh, Mendeley. Okay. But like, fear not, because I've actually spoken to some quite senior professors mm. uh, as a member as a, for this podcast. And I've been really surprised at the amount of people when it comes to like citations and referencing in a paper, they still just use manual like they do it themselves, which blows my mind mm. because it's all about where do you put a comma and periods and I just like my brain oh. cannot handle that. No, no, that that scares me. I'm not going to lie. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to that in, in good. You'll get in there. You'll get there. <laughs> and, and we've got great librarians, so they can help yes. you out with that as well. Love your librarian. Definitely do that. Exactly. Right. Next question. Again, might be too early, but again, I liked the top tip about Evernote. Um, making tables, graphs, images, figures, stuff like that for any of the work that you've done so far. What sort of uh, data visualization or tool or is it too early yet in the process? That's interesting. Um, so in order to present a little bit of the um, equality and diversity data that I had for the small groups that I was hosting, um, that came through Google Forms. I just asked people to fill in a form mm. and then it sorted it out for me. Handy pie charts. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I am a very, I use metaphor a lot and analogy a lot. So it, you're more likely to have an, a, a clip art or, or an image of something and then me explaining how that works in a document rather than a, a table or a graph, I would think. But we will see. Nice, I love that. MS Forms, you're the first to suggest that, so I like it. And I mm. love MS Forms and its mm. automatic graphs. Yay, does a lot of the work for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. Right. Now, on to very important things. Mm -hmm. um, when you're working at your desk, what is your favorite desk snack? <gasps> I told you it was an important one. It is an important one. Do I admit to the fact that the cake ratio is quite high or do I admit to the fact that now that I'm perimenopausal, I'm having to monitor the cake ratio, which is both important and disappointing? Mm. I don't know how to tell you this, but you've already let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the cake ratio is being monitored now, whereas previously it probably wasn't. So I'm aiming towards, quote, healthier snacks, uh, which is stuff that I try and make at home. So ah. kind of more nuts, a bit more protein, yep. but yep. also chocolate because that's necessary. And uh, sometimes that works depending on how organized I am. And sometimes it's no, there are chocolate digestives and there is no other option. And that therefore is what I'm doing. So yeah, fair enough. I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Right. Third last question. Uh, uh -huh. When you are planning or organizing now, whether that's for a project, whether that's for an application you're putting in, whether that's for some community work that you're doing, um, are you a digital planner and organizer or are you a pen and paper person? Again, it depends. It's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I like to scribble and I need to draw things out to work out how that's going to work. But if I'm going to convey that to somebody else, then it will invariably end up being digital so that other people can read it um, and therefore put the flow charts in or put in whatever needs to happen. So it depends on what the project is and how comfortable I feel with explaining it and how many people I need to share it with as to what format it will end up in. Nice. I like it. I like it. Um, what book are you currently reading? Ooh, I have just finished yesterday a book called Still the Sun, which was a fantasy novel about a space where they were trying to prevent the encroaching of darkness and a particular character that feeds on that by stopping the rotation of a planet because then it would never become nighttime. Who's and in this boss? fantasy world, oh, I've forgotten her name. Stick it in the email notes and I'll add it. But it was really good. I really, really liked it because the setting was different. 
the tropes were different, the whole premise was different, the main characters having flashbacks and you don't know why or how that's come about. Really, really interesting. Very interesting take on things. I really liked it. Oh, that sounds fascinating. That's going on my book list. Love it. <laughs> Right, last question of the Rapid 11 is who is a researcher who you admire? Oh, I'm actually going to say Nikki Fairfield. She's a lady I've gotten to know recently from the University of Portsmouth, and she's an associate professor associate professor in creative methodologies and that title I know I can see from your face and I was like why can't I be one of those um and she there was she was asked what kind of uh title she wanted to give herself in this role and that's the one she picked because everything that she does is centered around people and how people work and what they need in order to really flourish so that means a variety of different methodologies not just one two or the other so that's the title she picked and I'm like that's awesome so the first time I met her we had a walking meeting for an hour and we just did circuits around Victoria Park setting the world to rights so yes Nikki she's on my list um sounds amazing and if you like the idea of creative methods um and anybody out there who likes creative methods there is a researcher um two top names to kind of throw out there is professor joan coad who's Ooh. a nurse and she did a lot of creative methods um, because she works with a lot of children and it turns out children surveys or that sort of stuff doesn't work well for them for some odd reason mm, how strange um, and then there's another researcher who actually has uh, textbooks on creative research methods. Ooh. And her name is Helen Cara, I think, or Cara Helen. I always forget which way. I struggle when people have two first names. Oh. But again, um, for everybody out there listening, I will put those the, the title and the names of those people in the episode description. And Sharon, because I have your email, I will send you. Actually, I have. Yay one of Helen's books so you can borrow Ooh, Helen's book. thank you oh I like welcome. that remind me if I don't give it to you you have to remind me <laughs> okay I'll do that all right perfect right well that wraps up the rapid 11 and as everybody out there listening can tell I do know Sharon <laughs> <We're not strangers. laughs> we have worked together um, in her role at Portsmouth University Hospital Trust um, and I'd like to now ask you, Sharon, is can you tell everybody about you? You used an acronym when you introduced yourself, what a mm -hmm. PPI facilitator is, mm -hmm. as well as your research journey so far. Okay, yes, I will. Thank you. How so did you PPI, get into research? Yeah, um, I'm going to be completely honest here, entirely by accident. <clears throat> excuse me so PPI is patient and public involvement and those words describe how the public or how patients might be involved in research in different ways there are two ways broadly one is as a participant in research but the PPI bit that we're talking about is actually getting people's opinions their perspective their lived experience on research before it's live before it's gone out there before those people have been invited to take part to be able to benefit from their knowledge, their wisdom, their experience, so that the studies we produce actually make sense to the people for whom we are producing them. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are some other letters that have been added to this acronym. So you have PPIE, Patient and Public Involvement and Engagement. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to those two in a minute because I think they can be distinctive. But then at a meeting I was at recently with the ARC Wessex Long Term Conditions Research Group, apparently another letter has been added again PPIP, no, sorry, PPIEP. Patient and public involvement, engagement and participation. Now, I don't know who decided to add the other P. And I'll be honest, in my humble opinion, if you're engaged or you're involved, then you are participating. So yeah. why do we need the other P? Unless they're talking about participating in a research study as a participant. But participants aren't usually asked their opinion on things to yes. inform the study. So yeah. I'm questioning the arrival of this usurper, this additional P. I don't know where that's come from. Uh, if anyone listening has ideas or wisdom to share, then I'd be very interested in that. But um, yeah, comments in the bottom. 
but I don't know where the extra P has come from. It might be it's a really well-intentioned kind of a P, or it might be a superfluous P. I'm not entirely sure, I'll be honest. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so to sum up, my, my elevator pitch to people is it's my job to be a bridge between the research team and the wider community to let people know that research is happening and they can get involved if they want to. So as regards the involvement and the engagement bit, Engagement is the part where I go and talk to people or they come and talk to me or I visit community groups or other sorts of things. And I say, hey, mm -hmm. this is the thing that we're doing. And they ask me questions. Involvement, I think, is a more proactive. I am going to contribute something to the process of this study in order to improve it or to add my experience to that. So it's a step up in my mind to um, that participation role. There is also... Um, the University of Central Lancashire, they've been doing some really interesting work. There's a lady up there whose name I will find for you, who is a colleague of Lois Chaff, who's a lovely, lovely lady. And Lois is all about social pedagogy, which we'll get to in a little while, and also about social work, that they've produced a lattice of participation. So rather than a ladder, which suggests, and we can go into this in more detail if you want, oh, uh, yeah. suggests nothing at all to do with engagement up to through tokenistic which we are all familiar with up into something more authentic actually what her colleague has suggested is there are lots of different entry points for people to engage with research and all I of those are legitimate like yep. I really liked it too because it it recognizes that people are in different places in their lives for different reasons and that at whatever point they're engaging and connecting with you is valid for them in that moment. So who are we to judge whether that's more or less uh, meaningful or authentic to compare to someone else? Yeah, no, I, I really like that because again, it depending on the, the population that you're working with, you know, this podcast is all about health and mm. in a weird way, because it's all about health, it's actually all about illness. Yeah. Yeah. And people with significant health issues aren't well. Mm -hmm. And that inherently limits the amount of energy, ability, passion mm -hmm. that they may or may not have to offer to recreational activities like helping a random researcher with their their research yeah. study. And so I really like that idea of rather than it becoming this ladder or checklist, that it's a, mm -hmm. a lattice and it's then up to the, that relationship with that mm -hmm. researcher and that population and individuals within that population to decide who, where and what are going to stream. And I really like that. I'm going to have to yeah. look that up. Yeah, it's it really made sense to me. And it really challenged that hierarchical notion I had uh, mm. of thinking, well, if you're at the bottom of the ladder, then it's not very good. And I think universally, you can kind of you can talk about that very tokenistic at the bottom of the ladder. It's the part where you hand someone a leaflet. That's not relationship building. That's just an exchange of printed paper. Yeah. Um, but some people call that, you know, engagement or involvement. And it's it, Honestly, no, no, it's handing someone a leaflet. If someone hands me a, a restaurant leaflet through a door, I'm not engaging with them necessarily. And so I think I got stuck in my head a little bit that the higher up the ladder you go, the better it is in quotes. Mm. But actually, I think that that distorts it slightly and suggests that some contributions are more valid than others. And that's mm. wrong. And I, I so that that really challenged me. And I came across that on a training course um, with uh, an organization called Thempra. So that's T-H-E-M-P-R-A. And again, more links, more links coming. Um, and so that was when I found out about the, the lattice of participation. And I think particularly, as you say, if you've got someone who's living with chronic long term conditions, the fact that they've engaged with you for half an hour, that's going to wipe them out for the rest of the day. But they have felt validated. They have felt engaged. They felt listened to. They've been able to offer you something really important. And that's not any less valid than someone who can commit to a four hour meeting once a month. It's all yeah. about context. Yeah, 100%. So thank you for explaining that to everybody. Now that we know what a PPI facilitator is, how did you become such a thing? <laughs> well, 
once upon a time, a long time ago, uh, I was working as a freelancer. So I was working, I did youth work. I first came to Portsmouth in 2002. I did youth and children's work, qualified as a teacher many, many moons ago when there were still dinosaurs. And it got the youth work qualification as well. Came to Portsmouth and I was working in the youth service. And then I worked, um, I moved from that role because the role got made redundant. But I did a little bit of research in that role, looking at adolescent mental health and the provision for young people in the city. And that was my first experience of doing research. And I had no background in it whatsoever. So when I presented my report for CAMS, they looked a little bit nonplussed, bless them, because they were like, oh, this doesn't look like what we thought it was going to. But then once they'd read it through, they said, oh, this is actually quite useful. So hooray. Moved from there into uh, youth ministry work with the Church of England, and I did that for a little while. And then I changed roles again and became a freelancer. So in that space, I worked for 10 years doing all sorts of different projects, working with all sorts of different organisations across the city, lots of creative engagement in that. So, so what I mean by that is, let's say I want to have a conversation with somebody about a particular theme or there's an event or something going on. Mm -hmm. what is the what are the tools or the mechanisms or the methodologies that I might want to use to engage with these people to make it as easy as possible so it's not mm. dependent on language it's not dependent on literacy it's not dependent on a certain level of understanding how can I create and hold a space for you to have a conversation with me so that you are feeling safe and comfortable and respected and I'm able to find out what I'd like to know. All mm. sorts of stuff everywhere. I did chaplaincy work. I worked with the university, with the city council, um, all over the shop. And it was really interesting and really varied. But the last major contract I did was with Portsmouth Cathedral where mm -hmm. I was the annual theme curator and there again using creative practice to engage people in different themes and conversations not heavily religious either it was much more the bigger themes around time or the environment or mm -hmm. different things like that and the funding for that role ran out and I thought mm -hmm. ah, that's interesting I kind of need some work and I was and I was just on the cusp it was a very interesting tilting point because I'd applied to the Arts Council for funding to develop my creative practice. And I had got to the point where I felt much happier about using the title of artist for the work that I was doing. And I got very excited about it. It is still a lot, a lot of stuff that I do is creative um, and it brings me a lot of joy and a lot of peace. And I feel very centred when I'm doing that. But I pushed on the doors and I pushed on the doors and they closed. I just couldn't get funding from anywhere. And then I came across... Um, a lady called Alice Mortlock, who used to work at the hospital. I was working with her husband, Gavin, who was doing lots of creative work in the city. And he said, oh, there's a job going at the hospital if you're interested. And I thought, I've never worked in a hospital. I don't know what I bring to a hospital. That would just be weird. But nonetheless, I went to have a conversation with Alice and I listened and I thought, oh, no, maybe I could do that. And yeah, OK. So I applied for the role and I got it. And in fact, that was the place where I met you because you were on the mm -hmm. interview for that job. And so there I was, a creative practitioner with teaching and youth work experience, suddenly in the NHS, thinking this is like I'm learning a whole new language here. This is a whole they're using oscopies quite a lot. I don't know what that's for. And uh, I think <laughs> the best bit was when I came into the office about three or four weeks into my new job to discover a very weighty looking book uh, entitled list of vaginal cancers and I thought ah you know when you're in the NHS when these two books are just lying around okay <laughs> so that was you know and I that process was a transition for me because I was genuinely sad about not being able to pursue a more creative career in that conventional way mm. And it was something I'd really wanted to do. And I had to grieve that and I had to let it go. Mm. But in hindsight, the timing was very good. And perhaps, you know, if you if you hold a faith, you might recognise it as a pivot point or maybe you think the universe intervenes, whichever, you know, whatever feels comfortable for you. But that transition took place in 2019. Mm. And I started work in February of 2019 and I closed down my freelance work uh, by around May of that year. And looking back on it now, if I had been working freelance during 2020, during lockdown, we our house would have been our household would have struggled incredibly. Absolutely. Because I was the major earner as well in our house. 
Mm-hmm. So we would have really, really been up against it. But as it was, I was in a place where I had a secure income, I had a steady job, and I was able to bring some of the gifts and skills that I had into this place where people needed it. And I can't take blood pressure, I can't do IVs, I can't go onto wards, but you know what? I can make cake and I can listen to people and I can be encouraging and drop little notes around the place and bring in fresh flowers and listen to people. And so I brought what I could into the space that might be helpful and discovered it actually lined up with my values an awful lot, which was all about being person-centered, about valuing the person in front of you, about creating a space that says what you have to offer here is worthwhile and interesting, and Mm. I can learn something from you, and it makes things better for lots of people. So I didn't expect that at all, I'll be honest. Mm. I didn't expect it, but this is why I've stayed, because the work that I'm doing lines up with my values. And I feel like I'm making a difference. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that very personal, but very um, beautiful story of it. So thank you. You can be you. (laughs) This role actually, like you say, has allowed you to filter in those Mm. creative touches that you do, those enabling conversations and those enabling environments and spaces to facilitate different voices to be heard. It's Mm -hmm. just, as I understand what you're saying, it's just that that context has changed. So instead of it being about a youth ministry or something, you know, related to the COE themes of the year or any Mm -hmm. of the other multiplicity of different uh, projects that you've worked on. It's now shifted to be around health and illness and research, Mm -hmm. health research. Okay. So you got the job, you're running it, you're loving it. It's allowing you to do your values. Um, So PPI facility, forever then no but that's because partly because I like to stretch things and I like to change them anyway Mm. and partly because I've reached a space in my uh, career to date where I'm beginning to recognize that there are some boundaries around this role that have come about because of historically how it's been set up I don't think anyone set out to do it in this way, but it's sort of come about through happenstance and I'm looking at it and it feels like um, I'm going to describe it like a box with plastic walls. You can push against it. It has some flex, but it's not giving and it needs to give. It needs to give some more. There needs to be a better understanding. So PPI, as in public involvement, was way back when um, the responsibility of academics So whoever the researcher was, they were the person who had to go and find, connect with, have conversations with members of the public or these different patient groups in order to understand their perspective and use that to inform the quality of the study design to make sure that the study really reflects that and produces something really useful at the end. Mm -hmm. But then academic kind of got a bit swamped with stuff. And maybe they didn't feel they had the skills or maybe they didn't have the time to process things like PPI payments, which is a recognition of the value of somebody's time. And some people might want that and some people might not, but um, they were getting a bit swamped. So they kind of it began as an admin role, began mm-hmm. as an admin role. Just, oh, can you help me organize a room? Can you get me, you know, can you email out the meeting details to people? Can you sort out the PPI payments afterwards? And it gradually expanded and expanded. But I think the understanding of the role has kind of remained as an administrative one rather than taking on board the breadth of what it now involves. So I think the 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 role where it's got to in some places is a little bit like here comes another analogy, a petrol station manager. So let's okay. imagine that a research study is a car. And it comes along to the petrol station and it says, I need PPI, please. And it fills up with PPI, fills up with petrol and off it goes. And the PPI people, you know, the people contributing to that study are very excited about it. But they don't really hear from that car again because it disappeared down the road. Maybe it got funding. Maybe it didn't. Maybe it took a detour. So the the feedback loop is a thing which I know you're very familiar with. But 
you know, that's fine. We wave the little mini metro off into the distance and another car comes and it needs petrol. So you fill it up with PPI and off it goes and another one comes. So the role of a PPI facilitator or a, a public involvement lead is broadly speaking that of a garage manager. You provide PPI. You bring in people in order mm. that they can fill up the little car with petrol and off it goes again. And then if you're fortunate enough and you're still in contact with the car, you can then phone those people and say, hey, how are you getting on? And then feed back to your PPI people. But it's basically this cycle of you know filling up with petrol and off they go. So there is no expansion for the role or additional breadth or depth mm. because it wasn't ever considered in that way. Yeah, And again, I don't think anyone did this intentionally. It's just the, the natural development of what's happened to this point. However, what ha what is happening and perhaps hasn't been weighed or considered is the fact that in order to find people to do PPI groups with and focus groups with, that person, the PPI lead, needs to go out and about and make networks and make connections and find these people and form relationships with them and figure out who they are and what they need. Because mm. actually, if you're going to have public involvement, it should be equally beneficial, mm -hmm. mutually beneficial, and not yeah. just, I take what I want from you and then off we go. Yeah. The general public don't really like being used like that. And I wouldn't blame them. No, they want agreed. to understand. They're excited. They want to contribute to something. They want to feel that what they're contributing is valued. In the research I did for my internship, which we'll get to in a minute, um, one of the things that one of the public contributors raised is she said one of the big problems with PPI is that there's no support afterwards. Researchers say, that's great. Thank you so much for your interest. We really appreciate it. And then that's it. And it's done. But there's no place to process if it's been a trigger warning, if it's been something very emotional or very personal. If you're talking about your life experience and you went through a really difficult time and that's why that knowledge is so crucial to the study. But nobody's there to help you process that afterwards. Mm. In another setting, it would be clinical supervision. In another setting, it would be a chance to talk through how did that make you feel? You know, what, what are you going to do now to look after yourself? How are yeah. you going to process yeah. that? But that doesn't happen because mm. there isn't the understanding of the relational element and the personal element that goes into that. And likewise, as a, as a PPI lead, if I have conversations with people and they're telling me really significant, really personal things, I don't get. Well, I do now because I've asked for it, but there isn't clinical supervision for me afterwards. Mm. So people are talking about really sometimes really heavy personal things. And that's a privilege. It is a privilege to be trusted yeah. with that sort of information, yeah. but it means I'm carrying it. Yeah. What do I do with it? Where yeah. does it go? Where do I put it down? Yeah. Yeah. And there's that element of the role, which is, doesn't feature in the garage manager model at all, but it's happening. Mm. Yeah. It's, and I've worked with people over the last five years and I've had conversations about all sorts of things around mm. death, around funeral practices and people with long term conditions. A lady I spoke to a little while ago, she said, yeah, I take 30 pills a day. My entire day is ruled by the timing of when I take my medication yeah. and everything about it. My whole day is go governed by that. Yeah. And then yeah. I fit in other things around it. Yeah. And you really feel for that person. But what do you do with that afterwards? Yeah. It just sits there. Yeah. And and a lot of these situations, I have no power to change. No. But that's what my role asks of me. Yeah. So that's the sort of thing that I'm that I'm trying to raise awareness of and I'm trying to have discussions of. And I'm not the only person having this conversation. Mm. Lots of people in my position, in, in uh, both in healthcare and in universities and other research organisations, are having the same conversation. Mm. That actually people think they're familiar with PPI, but they're not as familiar mm. with it as they think. They know what the words mean, yeah. but the work that's involved in getting people to a place where they can have that conversation with you to help you with your research design is more than just the 50 minutes in that room. Yeah, there's the work but, that goes on beforehand and the work that goes on afterwards. But again, I think like your petrol station manager uh, metaphor, mm. analogy, maybe more than a One metaphor, um, is so appropriate because uh, from the car's perspective, they know where the petrol station is. They know if they drive up to it, they can get the petrol they need and they mm. know then that they can continue on their journey. Mm -hmm. And as a car driver, 
how often do you think about the burdens, the trials, the tribulations, the the paperwork, the all of that 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 petrol station mm. manager or gas station manager, if you're American, um, yeah. has to go through. And mm. and I agree with you. I don't think when PPI got set up any of this was really thought about and and the more you start to think about it the more you're like Mm. well of course somebody in your role should have a degree of clinical supervision of available support networks because Mm. how are you going to build a relationship around a person's health slash illness without them Mm, sharing yes. very deep and personal things and as nurses depending on where you're educated you get education on how how to do that how to mm. set up professional boundaries you have regular reflections that help you work through it you have most hospitals have access to some sort of counseling service where you can unburden mm. yourself if it becomes you know all of those things within healthcare professionals have been set up but as yeah With time, we're trying to make research more and more and more inclusive and more and more representative of of people's perspectives. And as Mm -hmm. we do that, we're pulling in more different people who aren't Mm -hmm. healthcare professionals, who don't have those resources. And it takes people like you to be like, "Uh, guys, (laughs) guys, guys, you know, and so I think I think I think the you raising these issues whether it's with your employer or through using your voice in the networks and the communities that that you have built I think that's Mm -hmm. crucial in order to change the role in order to move things forward so well done you (laughs) thank you it's 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 definitely a role that is in the space of if of evolving and the understanding mm. of PPI, PPIE, PPIEP <laughs> is also changing and evolving as people kind of grapple with it. And these things are happening in tandem with the larger organizations like the HRA and the NIHR, who have both mm-hmm. published this year additional guidance or commitments to public involvement, which in themselves are very interesting because they talk about and the way that they describe things is very relational. Mm-hmm. May help me find a way to in, be included. Help me feel valued. Respect the things that I asked for. They're written in that way, and yeah. we will commit to making people feel safe, making it easier for people to engage. So these things are very much person centered and they're person focused, and that's great. I like that a lot, and that's definitely putting the person of patient and public involvement in the middle of things, which is great. But it's not just the public, it's also the people around that space that help and facilitate. So I was at the Engage conference, which is hosted by the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement Mm -hmm. back in May. And one of the breakout sessions was around looking after yourself and others. And there were probably about 50 people in the room. And um, I asked the question after we were having that conversation. I said, how many people here get supervision? One person put their hand up and that was only because they'd had a background in social work where they had had supervision and they'd asked for it in their new role. People in the room didn't know what it was. They didn't know that it was a thing that they might want to ask for. They hadn't considered that there might be a space where you want to put all of that. That is the kind of environment that people are working in, not out of intentional negligence, but just a lack of understanding. Yeah, just a lack of understanding. So it's one of those things is very important. Yeah. And it's one of those things you don't know what you don't know until you know that you didn't don't don't know it. Yeah. And the only way of finding out that you didn't know it is to come across somebody who does know it. And then you're like, oh, that might be, you know, that could be useful. (laughs) Could be helpful. Right. I've just looked at the time and it is whizzing by. (laughs) So you hinted, I'm going to, I'm going to pull away from us talking because I could talk to you about PPI forever and maybe in another year's time, maybe we'll have to do like some sort of like spotlight on PPI, Mm. how to do it, why to do it, stuff like that. Put a pin on on that idea. (laughs) Um, But you hinted at it in that answer that your journey has already started to change Mm. and you mentioned something called an internship 
Now, for everybody out there who may not know what that means, explain where 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 is your journey going in research? That's a great question. So I came into the role thinking it was project management. And then the more I got into the role, the more I thought, oh, there are all these anomalies and strange lumpy bits and things that don't quite work the way they do. And I have had, and even fairly recently, although I will not say with whom or where, conversations sort of like, well, all this tea and cake is very nice, but what are you actually doing? Remember we said about relationship building and taking time to get to know people and language Mm -hmm. and and culture and things like Mm -hmm. that. Another conversation I had recently was, it would be really helpful if public contributors knew more about the language of research so they could help us better with the grants we're putting in. I, there is a blog post that I wrote about that one in particular called Pride and Prejudice, and it's on my blog, Ooh, which I know you're going to put the, the link description. to. Link in the description. <laughs> um, and after that meeting, I phoned a friend of mine who uh, used to work in research and now works sort of in a slightly different space. And I ranted for 20 yeah. minutes because I thought, how dare you? reduce these people to a useful tool to help you do your job better as if they're a stapler or some kind of a witty photocopier no they are people they are people who contribute what they can where they can if you're the smart person in the room make the effort to translate what you're talking about agreed Ooh, backing away now. So, and part of that comes from my background in teaching because if it's, if someone I was working with, I was trying to teach and they weren't getting it, it's not their fault. I own that knowledge. I'm the one with the power in the room. If I want somebody to understand something and they're not getting it, the onus is on me to make the extra effort yeah. to get them to a place where they can understand it. It's yeah. not their fault if they don't know something they don't know. Yep, yeah. 100%. So, anyway, backing away again. It made me very cross. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> so, so there was all that kind of thing going on. I thought, I need a way to explain to people all of this underpinning stuff around values and positioning and everything else in a way that makes sense to them because they clearly don't quite get it. Yeah. They understand the work that I do to be about a bunch of people in a room have a conversation about something that you want to talk about, and then you go away and you're happy and what happens to them afterwards. There's so much more to this going on. And so I started doing more research into it. I started reading more widely and beginning to realize that the conversations are happening, but they're not being articulated widely. Mm-hmm. They're not being articulated very well. And so I thought, I I need to do more about this. I need to find out more about this. I need to learn more about this. It was like an itch. I just had to scratch and, you know. So I applied for a research internship. And the the internship I've done was the second time I'd applied. I applied the first time and it wasn't successful. And it's basically a six month funded project that allows me to have one day a week to look at this particular topic that I'm interested in. Um, And I think I was the only PPI. I was the only person doing a PPI project for certain. I was the only PPI lead in the room. Mm. And. So that has been great. I've had lots and lots of training. I had a really, really good training course with the University of uh, Bournemouth University, looking at public involvement in research. Uh, The upshot, and it's a very, very good course. It's not the cheapest in the world, but it's very, very good. And it's co-designed and co-led with public contributors, which is brilliant. And essentially, we get to the end of it and think, you know what? It's not the public contributors that need training. It's the researchers that need training and they need to understand how to work with members of the public. Spot on. Absolutely great. Um, And then I also did training with Thempra, which was looking at social pedagogy. So social pedagogy is something which is widely used in Europe, not so common in the UK. You find it a lot in social work, but Mm. it's pedagogy is about teaching and learning Mm -hmm. and social is about those relationships that we have with each other Mm -hmm. so social pedagogy takes the view that the person in front of me has value and worth and dignity and they should be treated with respect how do I bring the skills and knowledge that I have to help you achieve your potential in whatever context that's in Mm. so EPI and healthcare, it would be how can I adapt to the meeting space? How can I take some time to get to know you? How can I figure out what's important to you? How can I make this space work for you so that we can understand and benefit from the knowledge that you have? Mm. Guess what, folks? Patients know things that we don't. Oh, yeah. 
to you, but that's a thing. It's happening. It's out there. Patients have knowledge that we don't have. And if we want yep. our research to be better, we need to be engaging with them. Yep. So that's the that's how social pedagogy works. And it's different to the more kind of um, patriarchal view, which says, I know what's wrong with your life and I'm going to tell you how to fix it. And then I'm going to be grumpy with you when you don't. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's how that works. And I I didn't even know that social pedagogy was a thing. I came across it by accident. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, you're using proper grown-up words to describe something I've been doing for years. I didn't know they were proper grown-up words. And it was so affirming because I've been using this kind of approach in youth work and teaching and community engagement all over the place in all these different contexts. It's like, oh, wait, you mean there are people who've written academic papers about this? It like has proper methodology. I, oh, I had to have a lie down. But the internship has essentially been exploring whether or not social pedagogy could be a useful methodology or approach mm. for PPI in healthcare. There are lots of frameworks that exist for PPI already, over 60 of them. Trish Greenhalgh did a great uh, systematic review, mm. but they're not widely used. They're not widely applied unless whoever wrote them absolutely pushes them and markets them to everybody in their particular clinical area. And then perhaps they might be more mm. widely adopted. We don't need another framework. Yep. What we need is a better and a clearer articulation of the how and why we do PPI. Mm. Than we do. So another analogy for you. And um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. But what I've got to and again, this is on the blog. What I've got to is that I think people think that PPI is a little bit like if I have all the components, then it should all sort of just work. So I've got my PPI rep, I've got my payments thing, I've got my role description, it's been through ethics, I've got a meeting date. And I'd like you to imagine, if you will, and we're getting into water now, some people are beginning to perhaps think about making Christmas cakes. I love making Christmas cake, fruit cakes, very pleasing. And so it's like they get all the ingredients, they've got the dried fruit, they've got their butter and the sugar and, their, you know, slug of brandy in there and whatever else. And they put all the ingredients in the bowl and then they look at it and they say, cake. And they expect the ingredients to somehow magically blend themselves together and then instantly become a properly baked fruitcake. Yep. It doesn't work like that. No. Nope. You have to soak the fruit the night before. You have to mix things together in a certain yep. order. You have to have hot water for your treacle. Oh, my goodness, you're going to make a mess. And, and then you have to bake it on a really low temperature for hours and then come back and poke it anxiously before you decide it's actually done. It takes, it's not just the ingredients that matter, it's how you work with them in order to produce the thing at the end. That's the bit that's missing, that people aren't quite getting if they're not in this space. People who do the work, people who understand about relational practice, they get it and they know that. And that's, I think, what has been missing is articulating that to people. And you can mm. adapt that to any setting, in any context, in any practice, but it's not just ingredients. It's more yeah. than beautifully yeah. said. So, <laughs> congratulations on the internship. Thank you. Um, before we wrap this up, one mm -hmm. last question: with the internship, um, and because I've heard a rumor about <laughs> you, um, I know that you are thinking about attempting putting in applications mm -hmm. to actually progress through your full researcher training to mm -hmm. become a researcher by completing a PhD. Master's now, first. Master's first. Let's not get overexcited. <laughs> One step well, at a time. baby steps, baby steps, even at <laughs> master's level and even within your area, your internship, you have started to shift your identity yeah yeah that's fair because just like when you first started as a ppi facilitator you uh went from being this creative person aspiring or trying or whatever you want to characterize mm. it as an artist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you said yourself you had to go through a grieving process to do that Mm. which totally understandable now you know you're about to complete your internship mm -hmm. yep just completed and, it last month oh congratulations and you've you. put in 
it's uh, more an application for some further funding to continue mm -hmm. on your research journey. So you've already started to change from being a PPI facilitator to a researcher who is a PPI facilitator, but who's specifically mm. researching around the how and why of PPI. And mm -hmm. I can only imagine how many challenges you've already come across <laughs> being, these were your words, not mine, mm. the only person in that room, in that cohort, who was a PPI lead. So just wondering very quickly if you can share a bit with that, that shift that even though it may not be part of your job yet, mm. that shift that you're starting to go through and what that's been like. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you summarise it and reflect it back to me because I don't think I would have ever imagined that I would be in this place at the moment just so far away but now that I think about it and I reflect on it here in a sense the process of research those conversations that exploration is perhaps in its essence it is still a creative practice in that I'm using particular tools to have a conversation with people yeah. in order to yeah. understand something. And, <clears throat> excuse me, where previously the outputs of that might, be, might have been expressed visually as an art installation or written work or something like that. Now the outputs are being expressed as a paper, as an article, as a poster. And I'm using the tools available to hold that space, to have a conversation. But in the middle of that space, it's still about people, what matters to them, what's important to them. How do we respect and nurture and um, enable people to be who they want to be in that space? But yes, it is a big shift. It is about language and it is about understanding and process. I'm learning an awful lot. Um, and I think one of the things that I found most tricky was because I was told at the beginning of my process with the internship that I wouldn't need PPI because essentially I uh, sorry, I wouldn't need ethical approval because I'm doing PPI on PPI. And I was um, wanting to include NHS staff as well. So then I was told, oh, well, you'll need HRA approval. Um, oh, well, that's a bit tricky. I wasn't planning for that. And then they said, but if you want to publish, then you do need ethical approval. OK, OK. So I had to pivot halfway through and shift from research to a service evaluation, which is essentially an internal project asking internal questions rather than an external project, which is more of what research is. <coughs> Excuse me. So there was a big shift there. And I think genuinely, if I hadn't written protocols before, because I did put in a submission for a long COVID study a while ago, if I hadn't put in and I hadn't done the work on a protocol um, and a patient information sheet and a consent form and so on, if I hadn't done that before, I knew I had some idea of what I was doing, I would have quit and pivoted to do something else mm. because it was so much work to do yeah. to have three focus groups who were all answering the same question and it, I didn't get the ethical approval until the end of June so I was already halfway through the process um, and it had and when I submitted everything and I completed the um, ethics application form and I did all the paperwork and sent it in I then got questions back which clearly indicated they hadn't read any of the things that I submitted because if they had they would have the answer to the question they'd read the plain English summary they hadn't read anything else Welcome to research. Backing away slowly. So, so all of that has been a really steep learning curve. And I did know it, but it's different to know it from the outside to actually going through it as a process. Yeah. And again, it's it's holding on to this thing of like, what are my values? Why am I doing this? What's the purpose of it? I'm contributing to a wider conversation. I am not the be all and end all and the solution to everything. I'm contributing to a conversation that is happening in and around me. And by contributing to that, I will hopefully be equipping other people to be more articulate about what they're doing and the changes they want to see happen, both within the NHS and outside of it. But at the same time, as I've said to you before, it's really frustrating trying to talk about something or talk to people about something they think they know 
but they don't know. Mm -hmm. So then you start Mm. getting into it and they're like, why do you need one of those? Why do you need to have this? Why are you involving them over there? I've had PPI woven in throughout my whole process, looking at the protocol, looking at the shape of the study. I've had people doing focus groups with me. I've had people doing a very light touch um, scoping review. I've had people who are going to review the transcripts with me. They're all public contributors because it needs to have their voice woven in throughout it. Why would Mm -hmm. I not do that? Mm -hmm. Is perhaps the better question. And whatever comes next, I'm going to send people into an absolute tizzy. Because if I do, if I am successful in applying for funding to do a master's, it's going to be participatory action because I want to do the work with people. And so when it comes to ethics, and there's another blog blog post about ethics, see the description below. um, I, they are going to be equally, they're going to be equally uh, rated and valued and included Mm -hmm. in the study team, but they may also be participants. It's going to make some people uncomfortable. I'm fine with that. I'm just going to allow more time for the ethic application process. I had a fantastic chat with a chap called David Carpenter recently, who you will know, who is an ethics consultant. Absolutely fabulous. Wore a very stunning bow tie on the day. Uh, Often to be seen in bow ties is David. And he said, I'm really looking forward to the day when I'm sent an ethical application and I can't work out who we should be asking permission from because it, public contributors are woven in so well and so equally valued that I can't work out who it is. I'm not mm. setting up to that challenge. I'm not stepping up to it. I see it over there. That's lovely. I may be walking in that general direction, but that's the thing that he wants to see more of. And I think more ethical committees want to see is the equity And there isn't equity. Ethics, the ethics process says, oh, but you're members of the public. You don't know things. So we're going to put you over here in this little box and limit what you can do. No, no, that is not that. No, stop it. Put that down. It's not it's not how that works. But until we tilt the power balance, then we'll continue to find public contributors in limited in a box where they are told what they know and what they can say. No, excuse me. Anyway, backing away once more. <laughs> oh, this has been so fascinating, Sharon. I mean, I feel very privileged that I know you. And oh, we've had so you. many conversations around PPI throughout our relationships. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that we will continue to have more. But I think your, your multiple transitions through your various roles, plus or minus being part of your identity, I think mm. is is a real um, is a real powerful example of entering a research journey and how you've been able to pull elements from other bits and parts of your life, your journey, to make that research journey that much more powerful, that much more impactful. Mm. Because you. you you didn't have to learn how valuable other voices were because you already believed that. That was already mm. core to your value. And so now you're in a much stronger position to be the person who's knocking on the HRA's door, mm. on NIHR's door going, uh, guys, would you take this PPI thing out of a box and mm. stop just adding more letters to it and hoping <laughs> it'll get better? <laughs> How about instead of adding more letters, like you said, instead of adding more letters, instead of adding more frameworks, we actually help people by telling them how it's Mm -hmm. done, when it's done well, and why Mm. that's important and how that matters. So I am very grateful of you taking your time to tell us a little bit about your journey. I feel like we need to do a whole separate sub-series with you. (laughs) (laughs) But I, I get the feeling, based on my knowledge of you and the fact you, again, and I loved how you did this, you just sort of were like, yeah, there was a blip on the road. I did get rejected, but whatever, I just kept going. And you did that <laughs> twice, once about an internship mm-hmm. and then once about a possible yeah, long a- COVID study. You yeah. know, so you're just, you're just taking in your stride and you're like, eh, it's a bump in the road, whatever, we just keep driving. That I, I can see... Very easily, I can envisage you doing your masters, and very easily, I can Thank envisage you. you going further than that. But 
not going to put that pressure on you. Let's <laughs> start with the Masters. Yes. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how things develop for you and Thank how you. you take this work, because I think it's much needed, much, much needed. I know for me and my own PhD, I was so frustrated mm. with the limitations that were placed on me Um by journals, by my PhD, mm. by publication, you know, on what you're, what you are able to squeeze into your four lines mm. that describe mm. your PPI and how much of the PPI work that I did just, other than the fact that I know it happened and the yeah. people I worked with knew it happened, there, mm. there wasn't really a space or a place to to share that. And so I think mm. the work that you're doing um, has huge potential impact, not just for you and your career, but for lots of other people and, and the work that they're doing. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been really good to have that reflective conversation with you about the, the process I've been on and the things I'm learning. And I'm, I'm learning loads and I will continue to learn loads. I sort of feel very much at the moment like brace yourself it's another analogy I feel like that if, that if if my research journey so far and my understanding of PPI has been an iced Christmas cake that I'm like yeah I think I've got that I'm all over that ribbon around the outside I know how that works and now the internship has been like slicing deep into it mm. and learning all of these other things and these different practices and things to consider and I'm like oh this is good this is chunky this is going to take a while to process but it's good. And I think one of the things of my training that was really good, but also kind of annoying, is that I realised how much more there is to do and how much better I could do my job. But that therefore requires more time. So, so recommendations for training, absolutely. But also be prepared to come away thinking, oh, pants. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love your like uh health warnings about uh, <laughs> entering into a research journey like it's great i love it but yeah it's gonna take a lot more time that uh, takes more time training takes more time everything yeah. takes more time and you are 100 percent right with that <laughs> but speaking of time we probably better wrap yes. this up because otherwise we'll be talking until like midnight the way that you and i go <laughs> <laughs> and nobody's gonna i mean i am not a joe rogan who can get away with the three hour podcast and people actually <laughs> listen to it. I'm not there yet. So no, no, that's fair. That's fair. Right. Um, everybody out there who's listening. Thank you so much for joining us and I will see you again in three weeks time. Take care. Bye. Bye. Don't go away. Up next, we have the top three takeaways from this week's podcast by Dr. Rosalind Austin. It came out in that episode, but I've known Sharon now for years and I had the honor of actually being on her interview panel for her role as a PPI facilitator. And I've watched sometimes closely and sometimes from afar, depending on where I was on my own journey, um, her grow so much um, into this role. And it was a real privilege today to have protected time to sit with her and to hear more about that journey. And I'm so grateful that she was willing to share some very personal aspects of that, her journey with us. Um, it was a real honor is, is the best word I can come up with. Right. Um, before we go into the top three, just a little reminder. Um, thank you to everybody who's recently subscribed or is liking the videos or commenting the videos on YouTube. It's really helping the channel's growing. So thank you. Um, if you're listening on a podcast through like Spotify or uh, Apple or whatever, please, 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 if you could uh, leave a re review, make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow depending on the platform, because again, that'll just help put this in more people's feed, bump it up the algorithm a little bit. Um, so that would be really great. Thank you. Um, so today's top three takeaways for me, I, I absolutely loved it. and I'd never heard of it and I will get a link to it from Sharon um, to make sure it goes in the episode description. Um, that idea that PPI or PPIEP -P 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 -E now 
as it is. So patient and public involvement and engagement and participation um, shouldn't be a hierarchy, but instead it should be thought about as a lattice. So allowing people to enter into research at whatever level is right for them, their personal health, their education, their literacy levels, maybe their developmental stages because there's youth as well. Um, and so I think I think that for me was a really interesting but also key part for me as a researcher to think about when I'm starting to develop my own in future um, areas of work to build into my research studies around patient and public involvement so I really I really found that interesting PPI as a latter as my top takeaway number one number two is and she's not the she might be the first she talked about in her journey how in so far in the courses she's been in um, around her initial stages of research training so doing an ARC Wessex NIHR ARC Wessex researcher initiation internship um, how she was the only PPI lead and she talked a bit about how her transitions through various different careers and focuses in her her life have been a major transition for her and how that has um, her journey now to become a researcher is leading to both professional as well as personal challenges and as a top takeaway I thought it was just a really nice maybe comfort blanket. I don't know. I'm thinking about using analogies now after listening to her talk because she's so good at them. Um, I'm not that skilled. Um, but a real like uh, comfort value. So yeah, I'm going to use comfort blanket because she talked about how being the first to do something um, is challenging and is hard. And that doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. But to acknowledge that you might need a little bit of support, whether that's through a network, whether that's through outside resources, as you go on this journey. And I felt like that was just a really good little token to say, you're not alone. Research is hard. And being the first to do maybe your methodology, maybe in your hospital, maybe in your professional role, um, being one of the few is a difficult thing and, and to acknowledge that as part of your journey is an important and valuable part of taking care of you. So I really appreciate her sharing that with us. The final takeaway for me is she was talking about how in her own research and looking into PPI and she referenced a literature review by Trisha Greenlee, which I'll try and find and put in the episode links um, in the episode description. Um, is for her and where she wants to grow more research around patient and public involvement is not building another framework, not having another structure, but actually trying to better clarify in in the right language so that more researchers will understand how to do more in depth level of PPI that goes just beyond what's expected in that grant application or that funding or fellowship application, but builds relationships with these communities that goes beyond that. Uh, she used that petrol station or gas station analogy of the researcher being in a car that drives up and gets what they need and then goes away, but instead is, is actually properly alongside whoever it is, the communities that they're they're looking to help and foster research in. And so I think for me, her her desire to do research around the how and the why, rather than merely describing or building another framework for other people to find, was really inspiring um, and, and challenging for me to think about how I can do that more in my own research. So yeah, the top the third top takeaway is around building in the how and why for your research. That's it for another episode here. Thank you so much for listening um, to the episode. Do remember to check out the episode descriptions. There's loads in there from like their favorite book to 
the the guest favorite book through to things that we talk resources that we talked about in the episode their own research that they've published how you can follow them on social media all of those things so do make sure you dive into those episode descriptions and it doesn't matter whether that's on youtube or on a podcast platform of choice it's all there with links and whatnot so do check it out thanks again for listening and remember to keep asking why Thank you.